There are seeing no further introductions. It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. This government loves to paint a rosy picture about the state of Ontario's economy. But yesterday, a report on CBC confirmed that Ontario has the second worst economy for young people in the country. The Jeez. second worst in the country. Wow. Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals failing Ontario's youth and the next generation? Why are they not giving young people hope and opportunity in the province of Ontario? Well, I appreciate the question. I recognize that all of us are concerned about ensuring that Ontario grows inclusively for all. Yep. We are outpacing the G7. We're leading the way in Canada. We outpace the average of the United States. Growth and jobs in our economy have been over 100,000 annually, over 720,000 since the depths of the recession. These are important factors. More importantly, we need to continue to invest in our young people. That's why we invested heavily in skills and training. That's why we've taken more steps towards university and college and post-secondary. That's why you put more into trades, all of which is helping our young people succeed. We recognize that youth unemployment has been a dramatic issue across the world, including the United States and other parts of Canada. We need to lower that unemployment rate for our young people. We need to foster experiential learning. And I commend our Deputy Premier, who has taken an extraordinary step to do just that. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, I was hoping I'd get a response from the Minister of Finance about this report that says it's not just the world. Here in Ontario, the second worst in Canada in terms of young people and the economy. That's not a record you should be proud of. That's whatever the government's been doing for 14 years, it's not working for young people. You know, the report, Mr. Speaker, part of Generation Squeeze's Code Red campaign, noted that in recent years, full-time earnings have fallen for young people in Ontario by $4,600. That's putting young people below the national average when it comes to income for full-time work. This is causing young people to put off important milestones, according to the report. Mr. Speaker, this is not encouraging for Ontario's youth. The second worst economy for young Canadians is in the province of Ontario. What is is this Minister of Finance going to do about that? Will he make sure young people are not let down Thank in this province? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, um, we all recognize that we need to invest in skills in our highly trained workforce to ensure that our young people are prepared for the jobs of tomorrow. The member opposite has oftentimes gone back to glory days of assembly line work with smokestacks and manufacturing of the past. We need to embrace the future, Mr. Speaker. They may want to go back to coal. They want to go back to the days when people weren't as skilled and as trained for the necessary jobs of tomorrow. We're doing that, Mr. Speaker. We're doing that through the work that's being done by, uh, by all the universities across Ontario and the leadership taken by Kitchener-Waterloo, Toronto and Ottawa on new innovations, on new techniques in agri-food processing, in clean tech, clean tech, which is a future for many young people that our member opposite yes, actually does not agree with, Mr. Speaker, and we need to ensure that our young people are prepared for those future Thank opportunities you. only by what— Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, I'm, I'm shaking my head at that response. It, it was absurd. We get a response on coal. When we have a, a CBC report here, Generation Squeeze, talking about the fact that young people are struggling in Ontario more than almost anywhere else in Canada, where you've seen full-time earnings have fallen by $4,600, where there's jobs available in Ontario that this government's not equipping young people for. The Chamber of Commerce report showed that we lose billions each year for jobs available in Ontario that young people aren't equipped for. And so, Rather than talk about coal or something, nothing related to the question, what I'd appreciate is an answer from the Minister of Finance on this report that was published in the CBC <coughs> that shows young people in Ontario are falling behind. What is the Minister of question. Finance going to do to make sure young people in Ontario aren't put last in Canada by this government? <laughs> Thank you. There goes my birthday present.
Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the fact is, youth employment actually rose 7,500 in, in February 2017, and youth unemployment rate actually went down by 1.7 percent. But more can be done, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are trying to reduce the skills gap with high skilled workforce. And I got to say, Mr. Speaker, the Employment Ontario Network has now helped approximately 1 million Ontarians, many young people, from 2015 to 16, including 122,800 employees Order. across Ontario. We're investing $173 million in 2016-17 to offer a range of programs that support apprentices, employers, and training delivery agents. And in April of 2015, the government also invested $55 million over three years to help the next generation of skilled tradespeople. And as a result of the government's investments and support of the apprenticeship programs, new apprenticeship preparatory stations have grown by 17,100 and more than 25,000 in 2015-16. More needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. We are doing our utmost, Thank you. and we put so in the budget. With Thank you. Sorry. New question, the member from Halliburton. Mr. Speaker, my question is the Minister of Status for Women. Can I count on the minister's support for my bill requiring that judges be educated about how to properly handle sexual assault cases? Yes, minister. Uh, the Minister for Community uh, Safety and Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. It gives me great pleasure. I thank the member for her question. Um, sexual assault is a very, very serious issue that demands attention from all levels of government. And I have to say, as the Attorney General uh, has said before, this is a nonpartisan issue, Mr. Speaker. The Attorney General has made it clear that we are actively looking into what more can be done about sexual assault education for judges. The Chief Justice has reassured the Attorney General that the ongoing education of our judiciary is critically important to public confidence in the system. The Court has provided education on issues related to sexual assault and violence against women for over 30 years. I also know that Ontario judges have expressed to the federal training program have access yes, to the federal training programs offered by the National Judicial Institute and can directly benefit from these new support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to go back to the uh, Minister for the Status of Women because I know she, in particular, must be aware of the importance of this kind of training. There are still incredible stigmas attached to sexual assault. Sexual assault is chronically underreported in Canada, with about 90 per cent of women never bringing their cases forward. Our judges should have the tools they need to treat these cases with the utmost sensitivity. So I've spoken with many women's and victim service organizations, and all of them support mandatory sexual assault law training. This is a nonpartisan issue. So we must protect women from being re-victimized, especially after having the bravery to come forward about their experiences in the first place. Since this Attorney General has not been clear where he stands on this issue, I'm wondering Question. if I can count on the support of the minister responsible for the status of women to convince him of the importance and help move these changes forward. Again, I thank the member for her question, and, and I have to say, I think the Attorney General has made it very clear that we are actively looking into what more can be done about sexual assault education for judges. Uh, we are actively looking into more about what more can be done. And as the member has mentioned, and we're saying, this is a nonpartisan issue. So, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for her question, and we'll look. Thank you very much. I want to hear. Final supplementary. Um, well, Mr. Speaker, I believe the Minister for the Status of Women was trying to answer my previous question, so I will go back to her again. Uh, I want to share a story that Rona Ambrose shared in the federal parliament. It's that of a Halifax taxi driver who was acquitted of sexual assault charges. The judge in question ruled that clearly a drunk can consent. We know that not to be true, as countless legal experts have torn that ruling to shreds. We can't have such basic mistakes being made in our courts. So, Mr. Speaker, will this government 
mandate sexual assault training before Ontario has a case as egregious as was in Nova Scotia. Again, thank you very much for the supplement. Um, Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I have to say that um, this is a very important issue. And I think that we all agree, and I know a colleague here in the House, the member from Davenport, has also and is a strong advocate for this. I want to say thank you to the member actually from Davenport for her interest in this very important area. And as a member, as as a member of this house, she has the right and responsibility to raise important issues affecting her constituents. And we look forward to renewing. Order, please. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, come to order. Finish, please. And I have to end by saying, actually, I look forward, uh, and I think we all do look forward to reviewing the bill once it is tabled in the, in the legislature and the ongoing dialogue and debates. The member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. You have a wrap-up sentence, please. Well, and again, I'll say as a as a member of this house, as a woman, as a mother, I know how this issue is sensitive and important, and I know that we can do more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. The premier said this week that uh, reports of some residents in Toronto seeing their rents double is unacceptable. This morning, I called for unanimous consent to pass a bill that would make this unacceptable practice illegal now. The Premier's Liberal government said no to stopping the unfair gouging right away. Why? Well, thank you, Speaker, and happy birthday. Um, the Premier has been clear many, many times, the Minister of Housing has been clear that we are moving forward with a plan to address unfair increases in rental costs. She has made that clear, Speaker. The NDP know that we have, we have said that, and we're actually happy that we're on the same page when it comes to helping families who are feeling the pinch of a rental market uh, struggling to keep up with demand, Speaker. I can tell you that our plan will go further and do more than the NDP is proposing. So the political games that are being played, Speaker, are um, not particularly helpful. We are uh, looking forward to introducing a bill that will actually address a larger problem. Once again, after 14 years of doing nothing, this Premier and her Minister of Housing have admitted that there's a problem. This morning, we did something very simple, and we asked for the Premier's Liberal government to close the 1991 rent control loophole today to protect tenants from unscrupulous landlords. This should have been a no-brainer, Speaker. Are the Liberals allowing more renters to be ripped off while we wait for their bill because they fear that supporting the bill currently before the House won't give them enough political credit. Thank you. To the Minister of Housing. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the leader of the third party for uh, the question. Again, as the Premier has said uh, and made clear many, many times, along with myself, we will be bringing in uh, a forward. Uh, we'll be bringing forward a plan that addresses these unfair increases in rental costs. Right, and as I've said time and time again, in this house and outside this house, sooner rather than later. You know, Mr. Speaker, there's a whole host of things that that we will be bringing forward uh, we will the uh, the plan of the uh, of the uh, of the third party is a one issue a one issue only 
uh, idea. We have been looking at the RTA, the Residential Tenancy Act, since last June, Mr. Speaker, so that we Answer. can bring forward a very robust right. change. Thank you. Final supplement. This one issue, it's the issue that people are getting double rent increases and they can't afford them. That's the issue, Speaker. And there's a simple fix. Clearly, the Liberal government is playing partisan games with this issue. Sadly, it's what Ontarians have come to expect from the Liberals. What do the Liberals have to say, Speaker? What do they have to say to those Order. people who will see their rents double in the coming days, the coming weeks, while the Liberals drag their feet to score some political points before the next election? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, it's wonderful that the NDP have finally come to the table to talk about this. We've been working on this, Mr. Speaker, for many, many, many months. The rent control, the RTA, since last June, we've been looking at this. So, Speaker, why don't we just stop the games on the other side and move forward together? Let's help Ontarians realize their dream of having of having an affordable place to call home, Mr. Speaker. Politics has no place when it comes to finding people a good place to live. Thank you, Speaker. My next question, question the leader of the Thank third you, Speaker. My next question is for the Acting Premier. Look, the Premier and her minister have admitted that renters need help. Apparently, they've been working on it for a year. Well, in the meantime, time has been ticking, and people are losing their apartments because of economic evictions. But given the chance to do the right thing this morning, they said no. And I guess they said no because there's just not enough in it for them. Will the acting premier tell us how many Ontarians are going to lose their apartments due to excessive rent increases while they wait for the Liberal government to do the right thing? Well, thank you again, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, the leader of the third party for uh, for this continuing dialogue because it allows me to be able to stand up. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker, because it allows me to remind the leader of the third party that we are going to do more than simple rent control. That is a key part of what we're bringing in, the expansion of rent control, but we have been studying the whole host of surrounding issues through the Residential Tenancy Act, Speaker, and we'll be moving forward with some pretty significant changes in the near future. Mr. Speaker, we've said this time and again, I really wish the politics would stop on the other side. I really wish that, uh, that, the, uh, that the party opposite, the third party, would stop playing politics and really focus on making sure Thank people you. have a good place to— Thank you. Well, Speaker, since the Premier and her party refused to allow a bill to pass today that would protect renters, and they seem unconcerned with the number of people that will— be hurt waiting for the Liberals to finally do the from right Beaches, thing. East York. Will the acting premier, at the very least, tell renters that the Liberal bill, when it eventually gets here, will in fact be retroactive and cover the folks receiving rent increases this week and next week and then the week after that while they're busy looking out for their own political interests? Thank you. you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, Hang on. There. Minister? Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, what, uh, what I want to talk about now is that uh, looking at the, the whole Residential Tenancy Act since last June entailed us traveling across Canada, talking to landlords, yeah, talking yeah. to tenants about what needed to be changed. We will have a robust package of change that we'll bring forward, along with uh, expanding rent controls, Mr. Speaker. It's just not as simple as doing one. You have to do a whole bunch of them. But while I'm at it, Mr. Speaker, let me I can walk through a whole list of things that this government has done to ease the burden on renters and affordable housing. 
You know, we've made secondary suites uh, uh, legislation. We've passed inclusionary zoning. We've frozen the municipal tax on, on rental property. We've doubled, doubled the maximum refunds for first-time home buyers. Mr. Speaker, we're collecting data. We're working with the federal government to get it done. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, when there is a crisis, the government has to act quickly. And there is a crisis in the rental housing market today in Ontario. But the Premier seems more concerned with doing what's best for the Liberal Party as opposed to what's right for Ontarians. She refuses to tell people what she's going to do or when she's going to do it. But renters are suffering right now. Instead of playing politics at the expense of hardworking Ontarians, will the Liberals commit today to retroactive legislation that will protect renters now facing huge increases and the loss of their homes. Thank you. You say that, please. Thank you. <laughs> Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Um, and I should say happy birthday as well. You know, Speaker, uh, again, I'll go back to uh, what the uh, Deputy Premier started uh, uh, with her comments. The Premier has made it clear many times that we're moving forward with a plan to address unfair increases in rental costs. The NDP know that. The third party knows that. We appreciate that we're on the same page. We're delighted that they're on the same page with us when it comes to helping families who are feeling the pinch of the rental market and who are struggling who are struggling to keep up a, a, a market that's struggling to keep up with demand. But, Speaker, as we said at the outset, our plan will go further and do more than what the NDP is proposing. You know, it's not the first time we've seen the NDP pay, play political games on, 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 on certain issues like this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning and happy birthday. Uh, Speaker, my question is uh, for the Deputy Premier this morning. Big trouble for a GTA employer. Kisco Freezies uh, has more than 200 employees here in Toronto that saw their hydro bill go up $100,000 last year. $100,000. According to their president, they don't qualify for the government's hydro scheme. He said, quote, we get nothing back. We pay and we pay. Speaker, how many more jobs is this Liberal government yeah. going to chase out of Ontario before they do something for our job creators? Oh, Mr. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, the Minister of Energy. Mr. Benerji. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and, and talk, uh, talk about our plan, Mr. Speaker, the one that's actually going to help 500,000 small businesses and farms right across the province, Mr. Speaker. And let's not forget, too, that the Minister of Economic Development and I were just in Brampton this morning Brampton. talking about how another company is going to be saving 20 percent, Mr. Speaker, $2 million on their electricity bill. And all of this, Mr. Speaker, is part of our Ontario Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, a plan that is actually going to be put into effect by this summer, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we can help everyone right across the province. Unlike the party opposite, Mr. Speaker, that has no plan. We heard that they once had a five-point plan and then a three-point plan, and now, Mr. Speaker, no they plan. have no plan. Answer. No plan for hydro, no plan for Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We are the Thank government you. that acts and helps businesses. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this is the government that has bungled this file like no other file that we have ever seen. And they have the audacity to stand here and expect us to clean it up for them. Their plan has so many holes in it, it's like Swiss cheese, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Kisco Freezies creates jobs here in Ontario. They actually go over there and create jobs at their suppliers as well. They source their corrugated containers, their uh, plastic, and uh, most of their supplies right here in Ontario. But their CEO told Global News this week more and more businesses are going to pack up and move to the United States. We know there is a coalition Question. of concerned manufacturers in Ontario hanging on by a thread. So why doesn't your latest scheme help fix that for those employers here in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very, very pleased to rise and talk about they that specific no company. Um, they qualify now, Mr. Speaker, thanks to our program, because they actually have 600 kilowatts of power, and we confirmed with uh, Electra, their electric company, that they qualify for the ICI program. So we have a plan that's helping businesses. They have no plan, Mr. Speaker. They're too busy writing hockey policy and not worrying about the people of Ontario. We are worrying about the people of Ontario. We are making sure that we are addressing this issue, Mr. Speaker, and helping these businesses. We're building infrastructure. The 427, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the MPP from Vaughan, the Minister of Transportation, is working hard that this business will see access to this. We're making sure that they got access to the ICI program, Mr. Answer. Speaker. They can keep talking about hockey policy. We'll keep working for the people of Ontario. Yeah. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Speaker, for the second time in about a week, the Minister of Energy has defended outrageous salaries for hydro executives. This, sorry, for the Minister of Energy. The CEO of the privatized Hydro One now makes six times the salary of his predecessor. God bless. And the CEO of OPG made over two million dollars last year even though the ceo of hydro Minister of infrastructure somehow somehow makes do with less than a third of that wow. oh. but the minister of energy thinks it's okay for ceos to extract these outrageous salaries from their customers is this why the minister thinks it's okay for private investors to drive up hydro bills so they can extract outrageous profits from the right payers of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise and comment once again on um, recognizing that, yes, Mr. Speaker, we've all acknowledged that these are um, high salaries, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to OPG, Thank the one individual much. that um, the uh, honourable member mentioned, this is the individual that is actually running our nuclear facilities, Mr. Speaker. We want to ensure that we have the best in the world to make sure that our nuclear facilities stay safe, Mr. Speaker. We also want to ensure that we have um, our nuclear facilities, Mr. Speaker, on, on refurbish right, uh, refurbishment right now at Darlington, Mr. Speaker, that they're on time and on budget. And the work that our executive team at OPG is doing, Mr. Speaker, is keeping them ahead of schedule and under budget, Mr. Speaker. And that's fantastic news because all of those savings, Mr. Speaker, go back to ratepayers. And when you're talking about salaries, Mr. Speaker, we're not even talking about a cent that would be on anybody's bills, Mr. Speaker. We're looking at making sure that we're taking 25% off all bills, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to do that come summer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, back to the Minister of Energy. The values who, of those who think these outrageous CEO salaries are acceptable are the same values of those who think it's acceptable to drive hydro bills up to the point where people have difficulty paying them. Ontario used to have a hydro system that reflected our public values, but the PCs and the Liberals have replaced this with a system based on different values. A system based on private profit, not public good. Will the minister restore the public values of Ontario's hydro system and stop the sell-off of Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, the system that he's talking about, Mr. Speaker, with when they were in power and when the Conservatives were in power, Mr. Speaker, their, their system, they let it actually disintegrate, Mr. Speaker. They let it fall to part, Mr. Speaker. We had to invest $50 billion. Let me say that again, $50 billion to ensure that we have a reliable system, Mr. Speaker. Now they want to go back to the way it was. It's like they want to be like the PCs, Mr. Speaker, and bring back coal. We actually eliminated coal, Mr. Speaker. That is like taking 7 million cars off the road, investing. Member from Hamilton, East Stony Creek, come to order. 
There we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government is not looking back, Mr. Speaker. This government is looking forward. We're creating jobs. We're building Ontario up. We're lowering electricity sure. bills for everyone, Mr. Speaker. We won't look to the past like our opposition parties. No question. The member from Eglinton Lawrence. I have a question for the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Mr. Minister, one of the things that Ontarians really appreciate is the safe, clean, fresh, wholesome food that they can get at their local grocery stores across Ontario. They love the fact that they can go into a grocery store and be assured that you have local farmers producing food that is produced locally, provides jobs, and they can eat that local food. I know that recently uh, some people have said, what more can we do to ensure that we not only invest in our local farmers, like Willemdale Farms up there in Brantford, and our local green grocers to make sure Question. that Ontarians appreciate the locally grown cabbages, beets, potatoes, and carrots, Thank you. and not always depend on foreign. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for that question this morning. I've had the opportunity uh, to tour uh, the member's riding. And what is always very impressive is the number of backyard gardens in many of the homes in the riding in Eglinton Lawrence. Oh. Buying and supporting local food creates jobs and supports economic growth in communities right across the province. All 107 members in this house should be extremely proud that we have 52,000 family farms in the province of Ontario. We produce more than 200 different foods and commodities that cater to the diversity of our population. Mr. Speaker, since his obsession with then Ag Minister Bill Newman, Foodland Ontario bread is turning 40 this year and serve as our government's primary tool to inform Ontarians of the many local food yes, options they have access to when buying their groceries, increasingly in eating out. Foodland Ontario is one of the most recognized brands Thank in you. the world today. So, Mr. Supplementary? Mr. Speaker, no, 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 no. Supplementary. Yes, and I know that Foodland Ontario is uh, celebrating its 40th year. And if you're talking about backyard gardens, you'll see in my writing what's being grown now in the backyards is garlic. Because garlic is now selling for $400 a bushel. So, therefore, they see the opportunity to have that locally grown garlic replace that foreign garlic that is no good. So we got to encourage local food. I'm going to have a garlic off. And I want to say that, you know, when I was in uh, my local grocery store, Lady York, there was somebody complaining about uh, cauliflower from California for 10 bucks. I said, forget the California cauliflower. You can buy a bag of Ontario potatoes for two ninety nine. Ten bags. Go ahead, Ontario potatoes. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the supplementary from the member from Eglinton Lawrence, and perhaps we should have an emergency debate this afternoon whether tomato is a fruit or a vegetable. But I know that uh, all of us, all of us here today, are particularly proud of what's grown in Ontario, and Ontarians to take this opportunity to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Foodland Roma. And for my friend, uh, the member from St. Catharines, who's a high-tech guy, I encourage everyone to also join the conversation online using hashtag Foodland40 or hashtag Love Aunt Food hashtags and check in all the ways, 40 ways to celebrate local food that will Answer. be featured throughout the year, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Energy Minister. A very sad story from my riding. A constituent in the town of Glencoe lost their house to a fire on January 8th of this year. 
but what followed in February was salt in the wound. A hydro bill for delivery of absolutely no energy after the removal of the hydrometer in the amount of $35. But, Speaker, what really set off alarm bells was the following month when this constituent received yet another bill, this time for $193.55, in which stated that Hydro One read the meter on February 28, 2017. Oh. To be clear, Hydro One claimed to have read a meter that was not there and presented a bill on the basis of this fictitious reading. Speaker, does the Liberal government think it's right to charge someone for Question. Hydro whose house was burned down and no longer exists? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that is a problem that should. Order, please. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, come to order. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, that's awful for that family. I know it must be difficult for them to be going through that. Um, and one of the things I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, is that they follow up with Hydro One because Hydro One has been correcting those issues, Mr. Speaker. That's the one thing that they've been doing. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's the one thing they have been doing, Mr. Speaker, is, is enhancing their customer service. And when you hear things like this, Mr. Speaker, of course, no one agrees with it. And that's why Hydro One has been acting quickly to Answer. ensure that they can fix and correct issues like this, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, back to the Energy Minister. The bill that followed the fake meter reading isn't just an issue for this constituent. It actually has costs for all taxpayers in Ontario as well. Through the Ontario Electricity Support Program, taxpayers were on the hook for almost $100 on top of the almost $200 the ratepayer was charged. Speaker, how can this Liberal government expect people to trust that energy prices are fair for families and businesses when people are being told their distributor is reading a meter that no longer exists, executive salaries are through the roof, and the cost of cap-and-trade is hidden? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, you know we feel for that family, and of course, hope everything is working well for that family. Um, again, as I'll say, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One recognized in the past, the new management team recognized in the past that um, their customer service needed improvement. The ombudsman uh, actually would, brought forward uh, many recommendations that the uh, the Hydro uh, One uh, management team and Hydro uh, Hydro One staff have been acting upon, Mr. Speaker. I again would encourage uh, my my friend opposite to uh, have that family call. Hydro One uh, immediately, and that will something that will be rectified uh, as quickly as possible, Mr. Speaker, because it is uh, one of the important things that Hydro One is, is doing, Mr. Speaker, and the, the team there is very proud to say that they're, they're working to change that dynamic, and uh, I would uh, hope that uh, the, he tells them to follow up. Yes, sir. Thank you. New question. Uh, Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. After a 10-year tick host study conducted across Ontario revealed that Corkscrew Island, located 20 kilometres southwest of Kenora, has the highest infection prevalence of Lyme disease ever reported in Canada, a research study last year determined that Lyme disease was found in eight species of ticks, with 41 per cent testing positive for Lyme, a disease with no cure. This research is a bombshell for people living in the Northwest, and despite its author sending a copy to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care last November, the government has not so much as even notified the public about it. The people in Kenora and across the Northwest are worried about contracting Lyme disease, and far too many are already suffering with this debilitating disease. Why is this government not acting on a health crisis that is greatly affecting Northerners? Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, this Lyme disease is a disease that uh, is affecting uh, many, uh, many parts of this province and, and many Ontarians. It's an important issue, and it's the reason why, uh, in July of last year, I, uh, Ontario uh, launched uh, the Combating Lyme Disease Through Collaborative Action Action Plan, which is a 10-step education and awareness plan, partly to deal with this specific issue that has been referenced with regards to the North, is to 
help Ontarians understand the risk that exists uh, in many parts of this province, including in the north, but also the steps that they can take as individuals, as parents, uh, as owners of animals as well, because this is a disease that affects humans and animals and uh, domesticated pets. Uh, but certainly when it comes yes, to uh, human infection, there are important measures that can and need to be taken uh, to prevent as well as Thank you. individuals are infected, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. What we already know about this, about chronic Lyme disease, is that it is a horrific disease with the potential to affect every system in the body and that it can result in paralysis. We also know that the most effective prevention of Lyme disease, once a tick has been attached for more than 24 hours, is to quickly treat it within 72 hours after it's removed. The problem is that the government doesn't have a strategy in place to treat Lyme disease, and not all physicians are versed in the best treatment options. Nearly three years ago, in 2014, this House passed a motion from the member from Algoma, Manitoulin, calling on the government to create a comprehensive and integrated Lyme disease strategy for Ontario, but it still hasn't happened. Minister, the risk of Lyme disease is at potentially crisis levels in Kenora. When is this government going to develop not just an awareness plan, but a concrete Question. and robust strategy on Lyme disease to protect the people in the Northwest and families all across this province? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is true that the member from Algoma, Algoma Manitoulin, has been uh, very uh, vocal about this issue. We've had many conversations. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think. Uh, in a collaborative way, I'll be meeting with him and some uh, stakeholders that are concerned about this issue uh, in the coming weeks, Mr. Speaker. But we also, in addition to that action plan that I referenced, and there is federal action as well taking place because this is an issue that doesn't just affect Ontario. But last year, we also uh, created a Lyme disease stakeholder group uh, to lead a review on existing uh, Lyme disease uh, issues. We are working with Public Health Ontario to update uh, on all elements of Lyme disease prevention as well as treatment education and awareness, including of health care professionals. I agree with the member opposite that this is a multifaceted Answer. issue. Uh, the, member, uh, the, the, the Minister of Climate Change reminded me that when it comes to the North as well, climate change Thank plays you. an aspect. We need to look at it in a multifactorial way. New question, the member from Durham. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. We know that this government has shown time and time again their commitment to supporting children across this great province. As the MPP for Durham, I am grateful that the government continues to support special needs so that children's centres like Grandview can help children, youth and youth to succeed. Two of Grandview's satellite locations are located in my riding of Durham, one in Port Perry and the other in Bowmanville. The staff and families I have met are formidable, and I'm extremely supportive of the important role they play in our community. But despite all their great work, the families supported by Grandview are constrained by the amount of space available for treatment. There is an overwhelming need for an expansion of Grandview that brings all locations together under one roof. Speaker, through you to the minister, Question. can you please share what you'll be doing to make sure that Grandview has a space to expand their services and continue to do great work Thank you. that they are doing in support of our children? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to take a moment just to thank the member uh, for his question. You know, as a former uh, chair of a school board and the work he's done around FASD and education, he's a strong advocate for the children in his community of Durham. Mr. Speaker, uh, since 2008-2009, my ministry has invested over $312 million of capital funding into Children's Treatment Centre. And I want to take a moment to, uh, to recognize the great work that Grandview is doing. And I also know that many of my colleagues, uh, including MPP uh, Dixon and MPP McCharles, also recognize the important work that they do. At my most uh, recent visit to Grandview, I met with family, staff and children. They shared stories with me on the incredible growth that's taking place in their region and the supports needed for the children at Grandview. They also stressed, stressed that there just wasn't enough Order. space to deliver the type of services that children need. Answer. They wanted to do more, but they couldn't. Grandview's capital request continues to be one of my top priorities, and a decision will be coming soon. Thank you. 
Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for sharing your experiences with the staff, children, and families of Grandview. I would have to agree with you. It is truly a remarkable centre. They are doing great work to support young people in Ontario. I mentioned earlier, Grandview has two satellite locations in my riding, and I see firsthand the great work being done by the staff to support young people in Durham. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you tell us about your most recent visit to Grandview, Chil Grandview's Children's Centre, and share some of the incredible things they are doing to help young people to thank succeed? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you again, and uh, happy birthday, Mr. Speaker. Um, as soon as the uh, legislature recessed for winter break, I made it a priority to get out there and to visit uh, Grandview Children's Centre. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is truly a remarkable centre. The staff at Grandview do great work every day, and I'd like to thank them for their dedication to helping children. They help young people increase their ability to participate at home, at school, in the community, and they prepare them to achieve their goals for adulthood. I value the services provided by Grandview and their continued commitment to providing support for children, youth and families. Mr. Speaker, um, as a government, uh, we want to make sure that we provide the types of supports that allow for young people to reach their full potential and that families are supported. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Central Bay. Uh, Speaker, uh, since the uh, Premier is in uh, calling with today, I'm going to ask the Minister of Transportation about uh, Highway 26. The member knows full well he's not supposed to make that kind of reference, and I would ask him not to do it again. Carry on. Uh, okay, Speaker, by not completing the five-laning of uh, Highway 26 at the east end of Collingwood, the province is holding up job creation and economic development. If this section of highway was completed, the town could extend Sir Sanford Framing Drive to Highway 26, a move that would spur significant commercial development in the area. This issue with the highway has been unresolved now for over a decade, and that's totally unacceptable. I've written the minister on several occasions about this matter, but apparently common courtesy has gone out the window because I can't get a response. This government has failed to Question. finish the job, Mr. Speaker. So I ask, when will the minister commit to finishing this section of Highway 26, and will he state when the work will take Good place? Job. Good job. Thank you. I thank, thanks very much, Speaker. I, uh, I thank the member opposite for his question. Um, I think he and I have chatted about this perhaps informally. Uh, I'm aware of the, uh, the challenges around Highway 26 in the Collingwood area. In fact, Speaker, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, with, uh, with the mayor and with so municipal staff the in the past uh, regarding this particular stretch of highway. I know that MTO has also been working closely with the municipality, and I understand the challenge. Uh, but it's a challenge that goes beyond Collingwood, Speaker. As that member may be aware, uh, prior to 2003, for many, many years, there was chronic underinvestment in infrastructure in every corner of this province. And that means that since 2003, in particular, in the last four years, we are playing both catch up and keep up. Uh, I'm happy to respond with additional information in the follow up question, but I do appreciate the member's advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank the minister. But the history of this was uh, during our last two years in office, we started the realignment of Highway 26. Uh, within a month of coming to office in 2003, you took the bulldozers off the highway. They remained off the highway for over a decade. Finally, when Donna Cansfield came along, mainly because she had a place up in Collingwood, she put the bulldozers back on, and you. You got most of the realignment done, but you failed to do the section at the east end of Collingwood that goes into Collingwood. It remains, it doesn't look very nice for tourists coming into the, to the gateway of the Georgian Triangle. And, uh, and there's a number of jobs held up, out some 70 jobs with various businesses uh, that want to move forward. Uh, their properties are frozen right now by your ministry. Uh, they can't move forward. It's a bit of an eyesore. It's uh, the council and mayor, as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, Question. and the minister, are at wit's end. There's a, there's a culvert or a bridge that's falling down. Your ministry said, get some boards in there to prop it up. It's going to cave in. Someone's going to get hurt. Thank you. And uh, you've, it's unfinished business. Thank you. You say it, please. You say it, please. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the follow-up stand, question. Stand, stand. As, I, as I mentioned in my first answer, I'm aware of the challenge. The ministry will continue to work with that community, and I have an expectation, not only in Collingwood but in every corner of Ontario, we will continue to make sure that shovels are in the ground, that they stay in the ground, and that we can keep building, Speaker. 
But it is interesting to note from the heckles coming on the other side of the House, Speaker, there are members on that side who have literally been talking to me for close to three years to demand that we spend more, ironically, only in their riding, Speaker. And every single year for those three years, those members, including the one asking that question, have voted consistently against the budgets from this side of the House that are building this province up, Speaker. In just a few weeks, we're sure the Minister of Finance will stand up and deliver another budget that will dedicate billions towards highway construction and expansions. I sincerely hope that member and his team finally support our budgets to build their communities up as well as ours. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank The member from Niagara West Landbrook will come to order. Order, please. No question. The member from Tri Stop the clock. I'm I'm not going to uh, entertain back and forth. The member from Timmins James Bay. New question. Well, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of uh, Health. Minister, I was uh, very surprised on Friday when I was up on the James Bay to find out that we're going to be shutting down the Air Orange helicopter base in Moose City this summer. As you know, there's new equipment that's been put in that base, as has been across this province. But for some reason, the base of Moose City, the only one that they're doing this way, they're going to be shutting down the base for two months this summer to take the helicopter away for maintenance. We're not doing that anywhere else in the province where we shut down bases when we do the maintenance on helicopters. Why are we shutting down Moosonee, and will you help us turn that around? Thank you. Minister of Health, welcome to well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I greatly appreciate the member opposite uh, raising uh, this issue with me. I believe we had a similar situation a year ago uh, where there was uh, the potential for a, uh, a pause in the operations of an aspect of Orange's work uh, in Moosini, uh, but we were able, quite frankly, with uh, cooperation uh, and uh, collaboration with the member opposite, we were able to come up with a solution that resulted uh, in seamless uh, and continuous uh, uh, Orange operation uh, and another model to address that. So I'm not. Uh, uh, familiar uh, with uh, all of the details of what's being proposed for this summer. I appreciate the fact that the member has raised it uh, with uh, us here in the legislature. Uh, I will uh, pursue more information and see if there is an opportunity to uh, look at this required maintenance in a different way. Thank you. Well, what, supplementary. supplementary to the minister. Last year, minister, the issue was it was new equipment and we had to train the pilots. So obviously, you've got to train them before they can fly them. So we made accommodations in order to allow that to happen. Fair enough. In this case, we're maintaining the helicopter. Every so many hours, we have to do routine maintenance to make sure that those machines are safe to fly for both the pilots and the crew along with patients. My point is, if we're not shutting down bases across Ontario, and I'm not advocating we should, why then are we allowing Air Orange to shut down the Moosonee Rotary Wing Base in order to maintain helicopters when we don't do that anywhere else in the province? Can you please look at it? Turn this around. Thank you, Minister. Uh, well, thank you, and again, I appreciate the question. So uh, I know it is a different situation uh, than it uh, was last year. Uh, one was training. This is maintenance. Uh, and um, but I, you know, I referenced last year because I think that we were heading in a similar direction in terms of the uh, potential uh, or perceived disruption that would occur during that training uh, period. Uh, I referenced it because I think that perhaps there might be an opportunity here. I know that hospital officials uh, have been consulted. I know that local officials have been uh, consulted by Orange with regards to this, which I think we all agree that maintenance is certainly required. Uh, but I'm, I will look into this in more detail, speak to the member opposite to see, uh, to provide uh, uh, the best possible solution that we can, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. New question, Member Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. One year ago today, first responders across Ontario celebrated as our government passed Bill 163, supporting Ontario's First Responders Act. Since then, I have heard from firefighters, paramedics and police officers from Kingston and the Islands who have benefited from this piece of legislation. In my riding, I know this increased level of support and heightened advocacy for mental health has had a significant impact on the lives of our community's first responders and those who are closest to them. 
First responders help keep my community safe and are always there for us when we need them the most. And this legislation was a big step forward for Ontario to make sure that they get the help and resources they need right away. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what progress have we made this year since Bill 163 becomes law? And please give a round of applause for our first responders who are here with us today. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member for that very important question and her own personal involvement in this issue. Speaker, we know that mental health in the workplace is an issue that demands the attention of everyone, its employers, employees, union, and the government. When we passed Bill 163 in the House a year ago, we knew it was going to do something to help people in this province because it provides a sense of security for those first responders and for their families. It ensures faster access to the WSIB treatment and the resources. Speaker, I'm proud to stand in the House today and tell you, as a result of the actions of this House, more than 600 first responders have already been helped by legislation wow. in one year alone, Speaker. That's 600 men and women who receive quicker access to benefits and the services that they, they need to get better. Speaker, I visited yes, with sir. paramedics this morning, Health and Police, Oakville Fire. We should be all proud of what we did a thank year you. ago. Speak. <laughs> Supplementary. I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. I'm thrilled to hear that this legislation has also helped so many people across Ontario. I think we can all be extremely proud that these efforts are felt in every single community across this province. It's encouraging to know that individuals felt confident that they could come forward and that there would be help on the other end for them. And I've spoken to Chief Charbonneau from the paramedics of Frontenac County about this, and he's been pleased with the measures that have been taken. It says a lot about the importance of eliminating the stigma around mental health and how our efforts in this area are working. In the last year, first responders in my community have talked to me about the second part of Bill 163 that requires them to create PTSD prevention plans. I know they've been hard at work on these plans in my riding and as well across the province. Can the minister please tell the House more about these efforts as the first responders in each of our communities are putting these plans together? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again for that question for the member from Kingston and the Islands. PTSD, Speaker, unfortunately, uh, the cure to PTSD continues to uh, elude us. So we need to put a tremendous amount of effort into preventing PTSD in the first place. When we passed the bill, we included in the legislation are a requirement that all employers of first responders file their prevention plans with my ministry as of April 23rd of this year. I'm looking forward to seeing those plans, seeing how we can highlight some of the best practices within those plans, and sharing that information right throughout the province. I want everyone to benefit from the plan, Speaker. I want everyone to submit the best plan they possibly could. That's why I'll be putting them online, posting them publicly, Speaker. Wow. This is the next step and keeping our first responders in Ontario healthy and safe, giving them the dignity, the respect they deserve. And thanks yes, again sir. to the House, particularly the member from Parkdale High Park, for what she did to make us all work together on this. Thank you. Sir. The question the member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Housing. Under this government, the waiting list for affordable housing has grown by 45,000 families. Every day we hear from people who are having trouble affording a place to live. Yet this government is allowing money that was supposed to go to social housing to be wasted and misused, despite the fact that I've pointed that out repeatedly. Social housing money at the Housing Services Corporation has gone to luxury vacations, bottles of wine, fancy dinners, and many, many trips to Europe. In 2014, a provincial appointee who was supposed to provide oversight resigned. After it was revealed, he was billing the HSC thousands of dollars every month through his consulting firm, as well as getting paid to be chair of the board. If this government is on top of the housing file, can they explain how they have failed to, Question. to fill this provincial appointment after two years? Minister of Housing. There we are. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, certainly Ontario is answering the call to provide more affordable housing across the province. I just want to—I want to touch on a couple of things, Speaker. Since uh, you know, since taking office, we've committed more than 2.4 billion to affordable housing. I think the total now is 
for housing in general. It's about five billion dollars this government has put into uh, into housing across Ontario, and I know that about 1.4 billion of that into housing in Toronto alone. You know, this is uh, this is quite a U-turn from the previous uh, PC government that abandoned any responsibility to support municipalities with delivery housing and downloaded. You know, I can tell you, Speaker, that those investments that this government has made, those investments that this government has made, have helped create over 20,000 affordable housing units and more than 275,000 repairs to social and affordable housing units. We're acting on this. The speaker, back to the minister, and I believe he missed the, uh, the, the question of the first question. Mr. Speaker, every dollar that Social Housing Services Corporation gets is a public dollar that was intended to provide social housing. We've heard from housing providers across Ontario that they could have saved substantial amounts of money if they weren't forced to buy through the Housing Services Corporation. The City of Toronto found that they could have saved $6.3 million in a single year if this government would allow them to purchase natural gas at the best price. That means in every, that in the three years since I raised this issue, Toronto alone could have had approximately $19 million more for social housing, wow. enough to reopen 380 of the units that they boarded up because they're not fit to live in. When Toronto community housing is Question. closing an average of one unit a day, why does this government refuse to let them save millions by simply buying the same product for a Thank cheaper you. price? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, and thank you to the uh, the member uh, for uh, for that question. You know, again, I'll go back to uh, what I said at the opening uh, of my uh, my initial response that that Ontario is answering the call to provide more affordable housing uh, across the province. You know, Speaker, we know we know that when when people have a house, a home, they're healthier. They're able to pursue employment and better equipped to participate and contribute to their communities. So I'll go back and say since 2003, this government has put $5 billion into affordable housing. $5 billion. Speaker, $22 million has been provided to Oxford County, for example. I can go on, I can go on, Speaker, with a long list of things that we've done. For example, one of the most exciting things that we're able to announce is $1.1 billion invested in cap and trade. You see that, please? Strange how I get to hear you. <laughs> point of order, the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. And on a point of privilege, I would ask everyone to join me in recognizing my friend and colleague, the uh, Minister of Community and Social Services, Dr. Helena Jasek, for being the recipient of the 2017 Canadian Helen Keller Award for her work in assisting, assisting Ontario's deaf and blind community. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.